going to begin. And just to let everybody know um, that the uh, format is as such that I will talk and, and then questions will be at the end. So don't ask me questions during. And the reason is, is because it kind of interrupts me and we don't want to interrupt the flow of the spirit so um, I'm very happy that you are all here let's uh, take a moment to remind ourselves of this moment let's take a moment to be aware of this moment and to thank the Lord Jesus for this great opportunity to be with one another this evening and to take in God's holy word that comes to nourish us, to nourish our soul, and to give us that consolation and that mercy that we are looking for. You may open your eyes. So you may be wondering why I am uh, not wearing a clerical shirt with a Roman collar. Well, it's there's a very simple explanation. They're all dirty. <laughs> and I need to do laundry. And I haven't had any time to do laundry. So I uh, that's the real simple explanation for why I'm not wearing a clerical shirt. I have um, a King James version of the Bible here uh, with, uh, with me. And then I have the English Standard Version of the Bible that I use, Catholic edition. And a lot of people ask me, well, Father, what's the difference? You know, uh, could I just use the Bible that um, the Jehovah Witnesses give me? Uh, you know, because they give it to me for free. Be careful! Not everything that is free in life is necessarily good. So there is a difference between the different Bibles. Of course, it's the, it, it's the Word of God. But the King James Version of the Bible is a... Protestant version of the Bible. We are Catholics, so we use the Catholic version of the Bible, which contains in the uh, Old Testament, which is the experience of the Hebrew people, 46 books. And the New Testament contains 27 books. Now, why is the Bible divided into two? Well, it's like a town in Europe where I come from. In Poland, there are very old uh, towns. Uh, Katrina comes also from Europe, so she knows very well we have old towns. And in these towns in Europe, you have uh, the old part of town that tells you the story of the people that used to live there in, in the olden times. And then you have the new part of town that tells you about the new people. So the Old Testament, as we call it, tells us the story of the people of God, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people. But we are the new people of God, the new Israel. Israel doesn't mean the country. The Bible, when it says Israel, is not talking about the country. It's talking about God's people. And we are God's people. And every town in Europe has a river that runs through it that gives life to the town. And that river for us is Jesus Christ. He gives life. You know, he says, I am the life, the resurrection, 
come to the water. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. John 10, 10. Come to the water. I give you that refreshment for your soul. That's Jesus Christ. He is the middle of the Bible as he should be also at the center of our life. He is at the center of the Bible and he should be at the center of our life. So where did the Bible come from? Well, early Christians did not have the Bible. The document as we what we call the Bible is uh, the word Bible is from the Greek library in Spanish. Those of you who know Spanish, biblioteca. We also have the same word in Polish. Biblioteca means library, uh, and it's a Greek word which means library because the Bible contains many books. I just told you forty six in the Old Testament and twenty seven in the New Testament. So it is a library of the different books. But in the early church, when I'm talking about the early church, I'm talking uh, before the year 400, the different Christian communities, so like in Antioch or in uh, Jerusalem or in Rome. So you, 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 you have in the New Testament the different letters of Paul, like Paul to the Romans, Paul to the Thessalonians, uh, this community, that community. They would be reading different letters from the, dif uh, from, uh, the different uh, writers at the time. So like uh, they would be not just reading the 27 documents, books that we have in the New Testament and the 46 that are in the Old Testament, but they'd be reading writings that you can now get on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, uh, like the letters of St. Clement uh, or the letters of Justin the Martyr or St. Ignatius of Antioch. They're all legitimate. They're wonderful, but they didn't make it into the document that we call the Bible, just like uh, there are other Gospels out there. There's only four Gospels in the Bible that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there are other Gospels out there, like the Gospel of Thomas, Mary Magdalene, uh, Peter, Judas, and others. You can get them all. They're they have great things to teach us, but they did not make it into the document that we call the Bible, which was produced in the year 397, 27th August of the year 397. There was a council called the Council of Carthage when the bishops gathered together and produced this document, which we know as the Bible. Before then, there was no Bible. So for the first 350 years after Jesus, there was no Bible. So the community comes first, not the Bible. So the Bible is not above the community. It's like people just say, you know, I can just be me and Jesus and my Bible at home and I can be a Christian. No, Christianity is dependent upon community. That's what the word church means. Community, assembly, ecclesia from Greek. What we are having here today. We are gathered in Jesus' name. Remember, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And we have this presence of Jesus in our midst. He's gathered here. He's nourishing us together. So uh, why is it that the other uh, Christian denominations that are not Catholic have a different Bible than we do? Very simple explanation. When the Protestant, because the, the Bible that we have is from that year 397, the Council of Carthage, when 
they came up with the canon that is in here. The canon just means the official list of the, the books that would make it in here. They voted on it at the council and they came up with it. And, and this happened in the year 397 because it was at that time that a man by the name of St. Augustine, he was the Bishop of Hippo in Northern Africa. He also wrote a very famous book, which I recommend to all of you because he's a very important church father. When we say church father, we're talking about uh, uh, a very important personality in the early church. And his book is called The Confessions. It's his conversion story. I highly, highly recommend it. And he said, this is crazy that all the different Christian communities, like I told you in Alexandria, in Jerusalem, in Rome, and in, in, in wherever, you know, they're all reading whatever they want. We need a central document. And he says, hey, guys, to all the bishops, okay, let's get together and let's come up with a central book. And that's where they came up with what we have today as the Bible. Uh, because people were reading in, in their different communities whatever they wanted. So that's why now in our gatherings, we read from the Bible and we consider all of those books that are in there as inspired. Inspired means that they under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And they gave a cutoff date the bishops at that council did for whatever would make it into the Bible. And that is the year 100. So anything before the year 100 made it in, if they thought that it was inspired, but anything written above the year 100 did not make it in. So that's extremely important to know. And this was the canon of the Bible up until the Protestant Reformation, which took place in the 1500s who started with a man named, uh, well, there were other ones before him, but really it took off with a man by the name of Martin Luther. Others had tried to reform, uh, bring reforms, but they did not have political backing like Martin Luther did. He was backed by the Duke of Saxony, who protected him. Uh, he protect, he, the Duke of Saxony protected him from the Roman Catholic Church who would have burned him, okay, uh, at the stake. Yeah, that's what happened to a gentleman by the name of John Huss in Prague, not too far from where I, I, I grew up, about two uh, hours from Prague, and there was a reformer in the 1400s, and all he really wanted, John Huss, was for the people to be able to drink from the cup, to be able to receive the precious blood. And the Pope in Rome uh, uh, sent a message and said, come to Rome, John. Come to Rome. Let's talk. And when he arrived, they had the fire already burning. Oh my goodness. And they burned him at the stake, you know, as a heretic. And so the same thing would have happened to Martin Luther. That's why when the Pope invited Martin Luther to come to Rome to talk, you know, he said, no way. Because <laughs> he knew what happened to John Huss in Prague. And we have two wonderful ladies here from uh, the Czech Republic. And from Prague, you're exactly from Prague. Oh, how, so you know about John Huss. He's, his statue is Jan Hus. Ah, now you know, Jan Hus. Yeah, the fire, exactly. There you go. So you know that big statue in the middle of Prague? Yeah, that's of Jan Hus, John Hus. And then there is a church right in the center of Prague. It's the Czech Hussite church. Everybody walks in and they think that it's uh, uh, Catholic, but it's really a Hussite church, the Czech Hussite church uh, there. It's called St. Nicholas. And the way you, you know it is because it has the cup there. Okay. Uh, and the, the cup is the symbol for that particular, uh, because they, the people wanted to drink 
the precious blood of Jesus from the cup. And they weren't allowed to. And so, and so this was uh, John Huss. But uh, Martin Luther the, succeeded in the Protestant Reformation, and he didn't like one thing. He didn't like the fact that we as Catholics pray for dead people. Because, you know, they were charging money for, you know, like um, there was a, a, a monk who was going around Europe at the time. His name was Tetzel. Okay, he was a Dominican monk. And they were building St. Peter's Basilica. And so uh, the Pope sent him out, this monk, in order to get uh, money uh, for the building of St. Peter's Basilica. And he was going around from each town to the next selling indulgences. So like these uh, coupons and to buy your relative out of purgatory. Okay. <laughs> and people were spending their entire life savings on these coupons to get your relative out of purgatory. Okay. So Martin Luther had a lot of validity to what he was saying because people were being abused. But he, of course, took it too far. Okay, we think, right? You know, he posted the 95 Theses and all of that, which most of the 95 Theses are now accepted by uh, uh, Catholicism. Uh, but uh, at the time, the people were being abused by m m many clergy clergymen and Martin Luther saw this and he says no but part of why we pray for dead people you know that that we 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 pray for those who have gone before us we don't believe that those who die just die and have no connection with us we believe that we have a connection with them and that is a specifically catholic thing that those who go before us, they, they, they are with us. And we get the praying for those who are dead from the second book of Maccabees, which is not found in the King James Version, but is found in the Catholic Version of the Bible. So that's extremely important for us to know that. So like, uh, let me bring this to you in another way. We believe in the communion of saints so that those in heaven and us, we are all connected. They are helping us. St. Teresa, the little flower, who was this French nun who died at the age of 24, and she always wanted to be a missionary to Vietnam, and she never got to be because she died of tuberculosis. She wrote a beautiful uh uh, autobiography of her life, the story of a soul. I just love it, okay? And she's always pictured with roses because she sends roses to people because she said, I'm going to spend my heaven doing good on what the saints do. They help us from heaven with their prayers. So what is the definition of a saint? Anybody who is in heaven. So... I hope that you all can think of somebody that has passed on in your own life. And if you believe that they are in heaven, then they are your personal saint, like my grandfather. He passed away. He was an atheist his whole life because he grew up under communism. And he was brainwashed into thinking that there isn't a God and everything changed in his life in one week when on a Tuesday he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And he used to make fun of my grandmother for praying her rosary, for going to church. They were married for 45 years. She never said anything. And on a Tuesday he was diagnosed with colon cancer, and the following Sunday, I walk into the kitchen, and I see him all dressed up. 
I said, no, this isn't weird. And I said, why are you all dressed up? And he says, I'm going to church with you today. Because what his faith gave him, you know, he was baptized. His parents baptized him. He had the, the seed of faith inside of him. And my grandma praying for him and him seeing her pray for him planted seeds in him. You, you don't see what you are planting in your family members by you praying for them and by them seeing you. Go to church. Read your Bible. Pray before you eat. You are planting seeds even in the people in restaurants before you eat. When you pray, you don't know, but they're looking at you and they're seeing you are witnessing. You don't have to say anything. It's the way you carry yourself by you wearing a rosary or a cross around your neck or a precious metal, or a scapular, or having a rosary in your car hanging from a window, or having a cross or a statue in your home. You are witnessing in the way you carry yourself. And my grandma witnessed to him for 45 years. And that witnessing brought fruit because what no communist manifesto could give him, no communist ideology could give him at a time in his life when he was dealing with cancer. The Lord Jesus Christ gave him. His faith gave him. And he came back to his faith. And now there isn't a day that passes by because he told me before he died. You know, he changed. The colon cancer changed him. He said to me, he said, this is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Because he changed. He was a really horrible person. You know, he beat my grandmother. He cheated on her. Really, I mean, you know, when I was small, he, you know, used to do things uh, I'm not, I, I don't know if I should get into it right now, but I mean, maybe at some other point, because I, if I get into it, I probably won't be able to finish the Bible study, but you can use your imagination that he was not a very nice person. And the colon cancer in his life was a gift. as horrible as it was, because it changed him. It brought him to God. It brought him to himself. I'll never forget when, uh, you know, he had a colonostomy bag and those colonostomy bags, they don't attach very well when you're just skin and bones, as he was. And my grandmother would be cleaning him. It's a horrible thing. And there was, you know, his feces all over. And I walk into the room and the stench was horrible. And she's cleaning him. And I open the door and I see this and I, I want to walk out. And she looks at me and she says, don't you dare. Get in here, she says. And she made me help her clean him up from the feces. And you know, he cried and I cried. He never cried before. I never saw him cry, ever. He was... <clears throat> and that's when I fell in love with him. It wasn't when, you know, he was doing horrible things like, you know, he's like, I'm going to make you a man, you know, and he'd take my, a, a piece of my skin and put a needle in it, you know, and all sorts of other things. I won't get into it. But it wasn't that, you know, that, that didn't do it, but it was that experience in that room during his colon cancer that brought us closer together 
and that has converted my grandfather into my own personal saint. And he said to me while he was still able to, he said, I'm going to be helping you from heaven. And you know, there isn't a day that doesn't go by that I don't find a penny somewhere. Because he was always fascinated by pennies. And I call it my pennies from heaven, you know. And you see the organ that we have here in the church. And I put on Facebook the testimony about the organ. I had military men help us bring the furniture from the church in Linden, New Jersey, so we could have all the accoutrements here in Divine Mercy Church in Las Vegas. And it was almost impossible to bring this organ down. It's extremely heavy, but through the grace of God, we had the U.S. military help us. But the organ, if you go and measure it is 48 inches long but the opening to the door is 43 inches of the choir loft and the guys this is all on facebook the guys from the military tried to bring the organ down and were unsuccessful the first time they had to bring it back up and they had resigned themselves we can't do it and then i look down and i see the little penny because I said, we need an organ here. And I saw the penny and I picked it up and I looked at the military guys and I said, try again. And they did. And here's the organ right here. Huh? Huh? That's faith. Huh? That's what faith does. Try again. And we did it. So that's our Catholic belief. We believe in the saints. And saints are not, you know, St. Jude, St. Dominic, St. this, St. that. You know, those are canonized saints. But we all need to have personal saints, you know, in our life. You know, like I have my own personal saint right now who I know is helping me. And I would venture to say all of you have those saints. That is why our faith is so beautiful. Huh? It's so wonderful. Mm. So this is the one difference that we have. And that's why there, you know, there are some books in the Bible that we have that are not contained in the other books. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the King James Version of the Bible. I read it. This is my copy. Look, okay. In fact, uh, those of you who know my story know that when I moved to Chicago, my parents were going through a horrible divorce and I was going through a horrible time in my life and I was a teenager and I was at McDonald's. One day I was having um, a, a double quarter pounder with cheese and a Diet Coke. Uh, okay, because you got to cut down somewhere. Okay. And these people from, the, from a local Baptist church found me there and they invited me over to their church and you know how they got me to go to their church they said we have pizza and i was sold and so i went and that's where they they taught me how to read the bible so i read i i learned how to read the bible not in the catholic church but i read i learned how to read the bible and fall in love with the bible at the apostolic church of god and they were absolutely fantastic that's why i praise the lord you know but then my aunt who has since passed away told my grandmother uh-huh uh -oh. yeah adam is going to a different church that's not catholic and she my grandmother came over from poland to visit and she looks at me and she says over my dead body <laughs> will you change religions our whole family has been catholic for generations and you will change your faith for pizza 
<laughs> so, uh, my grandmother has an incredible sense of incredible sense of humor. She's an a a absolutely wonderful, wonderful force in my life. But there, you know, there's nothing wrong with the King James version of the Bible. It's just a different version of the Bible. Why is it called King James? Because it was produced under King James in England in the 1600s. Okay, but there's nothing wrong with it. But a better translation for for me is the English Standard Version of the Bible. And I have these and they're all beautifully signed for all of you and kissed by me uh, for each and every one of you. So I have these. So I highly, highly uh, recommend um, uh, the English Standard Version of the Bible. So let's uh, delve. This is kind of, I always like to give a little background and things, okay? Uh, actually, um, uh, but I did prepare, okay, because I always prepare, you all know that, some uh, good news that I know you can use, but I like to give you a little background too. Do you like these backgrounds? I hope you like a little, little background of the history and things. I'd like to get into that for you all because that's a that's very important. You know, I went to school for a very long time so that I could uh, transmit all of these wonderful things to all of you. And I try to do it in such a way that is understandable to every, uh, every single person. So uh, it's, it, we have four different versions of the uh, Gospels in uh, the Bible. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first one to be written is actually not Matthew, it's Mark. And it was written around the year 60. And then each of them, I told you that every single one of the books is written for a particular community. So like the Gospel of Mark is written for the community of Christians living in Rome. And they were under heavy persecution. So that's why... Mark is not interested in giving you Jesus' birth because that ain't important for the community of Christians living in Rome under the persecution of the Emperor Nero around the year 60 who was burning Christians alive, putting them on posts and lighting up the city of Rome because Nero was a horrible person. He burned the city of Rome and blamed the Christians. Christianity was illegal until the year 313 when Constantine, the emperor, legalized Christianity with the Edict of Milan, just proclamation making Christianity legal. But up until that time, it was illegal to be a Christian. And so Mark is writing his particular gospel. Gospel means good news to these persecuted people and they want to know ab about the good news that will help them in their own situation. So he's talking about, you know, Jesus, the, the one who is coming to lift you from anything and everything that you are going through in your troubles. He's with you in your troubles. And so right now, this year is year B in the cycle that we have in the Catholic Church. We use um, uh, a three, different, um, three different yearly cycles so we can, um, so we can uh, read the Bible. Uh, and so right now we are in year B, which is we're reading from the Gospel of Mark. And I highly recommend for all of you, like people say to me, well, where should I start in reading the Bible? Gospel of Mark. Nothing better. And what should, how should I do it? Like 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, no more. Don't open the Bible and start reading and reading and reading and reading because it's like, you know, going to the gym. If you go to the gym and you start lifting a lot of weights, you ain't going to go back the next day because you've lifted too much and you get up the next day 
or and you're like, oh, I can't get out of bed. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> It'll be the same thing. Overload. You don't want that for yourself. Okay. You don't want that. So start slowly and no better place to start than the gospel of Mark. And you can get into uh, the life of Jesus right away, you know, in the gospel of Mark. So right now I want to look with all of you at the gospel of Mark chapter 6, right from verse 31. Okay, so does everybody know how to look for uh, a book in the Bible? Raise your hand if you don't, and I will explain it. If you don't know how to look for a book in the Bible, raise your hand. Okay, so at the top, you have the, the, the name of the book. So in this case, it's Mark. Then they will have two numbers. The first one is chapter. The second one is verse, okay? Very easy, all right? So I told you Matt, uh, Mark 6, so, and then verse uh, 31. Okay, and listen up. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all cities and out went them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Okay, so that's from the King James Version. Now I'm going to read to you the same thing from the English Standard Version, which I use. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place. So this one says desolate, which really means a desert place. Okay, same thing. What, is, what are they talking about? Like a Las Vegas, very dry. Okay. Okay, there you go. And rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. So they were very busy. You understand? So he told them, come and rest a while. And he invited them where? To a desert. Uh, that's why I'm in Las Vegas. <laughs> and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Okay, so he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is always presented as a shepherd. Now, sheep are not very smart. You know that. And Jesus says we are all his sheep and he is our shepherd. When the sheep is born and it's very young and it kind of is getting away from the shepherd because, you know, they become wayward and it starts going uh, on its own uh, on its own path uh, okay it it's uh becoming a wayward sheep uh a lost sheep there's danger that because it's getting away from the shepherd and away from the herd away from the herd which is the the, the community of sheep the shepherd has to go after that one. Because remember, Jesus is the one who leaves the 99 and goes after the one lost one. So he goes after the one that's getting away, the stray sheep, the little one. And what does the shepherd do in order to make sure that the sheep never gets away? He breaks the legs of 
the little sheep. We know that from shepherds in the time of Jesus, they would break the legs of the little sheep. The little lamb, the little, little, little lamb, okay? <laughs> he would break their legs and then he would do what? Put it on his shoulders. That's why you always see the image of the good shepherd carrying the sheep on his shoulders. Huh? Because their little legs would grow really fast because they're, they, they're, they're little bones. You know, they, they get put together very, very fast. That's why when even as human beings, you know, when you break your leg, when you are young, it gets put together very nicely. But when you're like 80 and you break a leg, not doesn't grow very nice, okay? That's just how it is. But the shepherd would carry the lamb, the sheep, on his, the lost one, the wayward one, on his shoulders. And, and it would get used to his smell. It would get used to being close to him. And then it would never get away from him. Now you understand why God has permitted your own legs to be broken in your life? You get it? That why my grandfather was permitted to go through the colon cancer? Because there's nothing bad that happens in this life that isn't permitted by God. God permits everything. All your problems, everything has the hand of God. Because God is all powerful and God could get rid of it like that, but he doesn't. Have you asked yourself the question why you had to go through the divorce? Why you had to go through the problem with your kids? The sickness, the depression, that, the other? Uh, if God is our loving father, there is nothing bad that he would permit for us. It's just our perception of it being bad, but it isn't bad. It's the way you see it. It's your mind that's the problem, not what you're going through. I'll never forget being invited by a family for dinner in one of my parishes. And I'm there and it was the little boy's turn to do grace before dinner, to pray before dinner. And he bows his head and he says, thank you, God, for my mommy, my daddy, my, my grandpa, my grandma. And thank you for the gerbil. And thank you for the turkey, the stuffing, the mashed potatoes, and the ice cream, and thank you for the chocolate cake. And then all of a sudden, there's this big pause, and we are all wondering what's going on. And little Jimmy puts his head up and says, Mommy, if I thank God for the spinach and broccoli, won't God know that I'm lying? <laughs> and that's how we are in life. We like the chocolate cake and the ice cream. Huh? We don't like the spinach and broccoli. But let me ask you a very fundamental question here tonight. What's better for you? Hello, I'm speaking. The chocolate cake or the spinach or, and the broccoli? The spinach and the broccoli is what's better for us, isn't it? Huh? We have a doctor here, right? Okay, isn't it? You know, the Swiss chard. It's good for you, even though you don't want it at the time. You prefer the chocolate cake and the ice cream. That's how we are as people. God had his son, Jesus Christ, and God allowed him to go through the cross. If God allowed his own son to go on the cross, was the cross good for Jesus or bad for Jesus? Of course it was good for Jesus. And your own cross is good for you. And unless you pick up your cross, says Jesus, and follow me, Every day, you are not worthy of me. You cannot be my disciple unless you pick up your cross and follow me daily, every single day. It's a daily thing. I get up and I say, alone, I won't be able to make it. But with Jesus, I can do everything. Mm? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. It's Jesus who lives in me. For if God is for me, who can be against me? Huh? I'm in Bible country here. I'm quoting to you all the wonderful scriptures. Now, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Huh? I fear nothing, for you are there to comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd. Mm, I shall not fear. Huh? Everything's going to be okay. Boy, I feel like preaching right now. Okay? Huh? The, huh? So you're understanding what I'm trying to say 
to all of us. And so Jesus presents here to us the desert. Now, when Jesus is inviting his disciples, when I say disciples, who am I talking about? Those people 2,000 years ago, the word disciple means student. It's from the Latin, discipuli, meaning student. So we are all disciples of Jesus, all of us, because we are here right now and we want to learn from him. And he's inviting them to rest. And where does he invite them to rest? Does he send them to rest on a vacation to Miami Beach? Is he sending them to Miami Beach? No. He could have because there's a lot of beaches. Beaches, I said, okay. In, <laughs> in, in the Holy Land. I was there. There's, uh, you know, uh, Pam and Tim are here. Corinne that went with me. We were on a beach as well. You know, the Holy Land has a lot of different places. Okay. Hmm? He could have sent them to the beach. The beach, I said, okay? It's hard for me to pronounce sometimes in English. So, you know, if I say, uh, but he doesn't. He sends them to a desert. He sends them to a desert, a desolate place to rest a while. Come on. When we think of resting, we don't think of, we think of Miami Beach. Uh, we think of Cabo, San Lucas, okay? Or San Jose, uh, but Jesus says, no way, Jose. <laughs> That's not where you're going to find rest. You find rest in the desert. And what do we meet in the desert? You meet the devil. Remember Jesus, 40 days in the desert. Because the number 40 in the Bible is a number of transformation. You get transformed in the 40 experience. The Israelites, how many years in the desert? 40 years. Huh? It's a place where you are tempted. And temptation comes from who? No. Temptation does not come from the devil. If you think temptation comes from the devil, then we, we need to pray the Lord's Prayer again. Huh? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Let, I want to hear it. And our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Who allows temptation in our life? God! There is nothing that happens in this life that isn't permitted by God. Even the devil has to play on God's playground. Huh? Even the devil. Look at the first chapter of the book of Job. Job is tempted by the devil. And who points out Job to tempt? God does. God sees the devil is, you know, going around not being busy. And, and he, God says to the devil, well, why aren't you busy, you know, tempting somebody? God says this to the devil in the first chapter of the book of Job. And the devil says, well, I don't have anybody to tempt. Well, what about my servant Job? God points him out to the devil. And he says, well, I, I, I can't tempt him because you have a shield around him. And God says, well, I'll take the shield off of him for a little while. You can tempt him, but you won't harm him. There you go. Huh? You can tempt him, but you won't harm him because there's nothing that is allowed in this life that can harm us. Mm. God has us protected. Everything is going to be okay. Bob Marley here tonight. Huh? Huh? Everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Isn't that the song? I guess I'm not singing it too well with that accent. Okay, I need to get my Jamaican accent on here. Okay, but everything is going to be okay. God allows everything that happens in our life for our own good. God allows the desert because the desert is good for us. And that's where we fight the devil in the desert. All of our life is a war. We are at war. Huh? So we have to fight the devil, resist him, solid in our faith. The first letter of Peter, 
Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for souls to devour. How do you resist him, the Bible says? Solid in your faith. Huh? And so Jesus is sending the disciples, and that's us, to not such a nice place, not to Miami Beach. He's sending the disciples to a desolate place, to a desert that's full of snakes. Huh? You got those around you? They're looking to bite your... Uh, Bite your behind. I was going to say something. Okay. They're looking to bite your. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, there is scorpions in the desert. It's no vacation. Huh? It's no vacation. That's, there's no, no sand there to lay on. Huh? It's hot. It's burning. Burn! Huh? No, no buffets set out over there. Huh? That's where Jesus is sending them to rest. Because it's only when you fight the devil. And where is the devil? In you. It's that voice in you that is trying to destroy you. Huh? It's only when you wage war with the devil that you will find rest. Huh? When you confront your sins, your addictions, all the impossible people in your life. Huh? When you confront the reality that you are living, not run away from the reality that you are living. Because see, a lot of people, they're running away from confronting the reality of their life. So you go away on a two-week vacation. Everything is going to be okay. You go away for two weeks. And then what happens? You come back. It's going to be worse than before because you're running away from your problems. Stop running, Jesus says. Go to the desert. Confront what, what is killing you. Kill it. You kill it, and then you'll be able to rest. That's what he's saying. That's why he's sending them to the desert, not to Miami Beach. And people think, you know, I'm going to come to Vegas and I'm going to go to the Strip. I mean, when I think of vacation, who, who would, who would want to come to the Strip? I mean, come on, you know. Like when I think of hell, it's probably walking down Fremont Street. With half naked people over there, you know. Yeah. If I want to see what hell's going to be like, I'm going to walk down, you know, with people half drunk, keeling over, drug addicts, people approaching people, offering them sex or whatever, you know. I mean, it's like, hello, people blowing their savings in the machines. Huh? That's vacation. Huh? Confront. The devil. Because you wage war in the desert against the devil. Huh? So, if you, whatever you need to change in your own life, this is what Jesus is getting at. That's what's going to allow you. You got to confront that. Deal with it. You know, not run away from dealing with it. Hmm? If you uh, are overweight, you have to deal with it. It's not going to go away like that by itself. You have to get into a program. Jesus is not sending you to rest in Disneyland or on a cruise. He's sending you to the desert. In other words, no escape. No escape. Stop running from who? From you. Stop running from you, is what Jesus is saying. Stop being your own worst enemy. Enter the desert. Where's the desert? In there. Huh? Get into the desert, and you will find rest. Huh? It's in the dark, the dirty, the not so... Uh, gracious and beautiful places in our life 
the desert that you will find rest. Stop saying, I will do it later. Mm. Later may not come. Remember, Jesus says that too. It's in the Bible. He says, stop talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow may not come. Now is the moment. This is the moment. That's why I started tonight by saying, let's take a moment to get into the moment, to be aware of the moment. It's now. It's a decision. People ask me all the time, Father Adam, where is faith? Where is your faith? Is faith in the mind? Is faith in the will, in the heart? In the, where is faith? In the soul? No, faith is in your ass. I said it. And that is a biblical word. Faith is in the ass because it's where you plant yourself. It's a decision. It's a decision. The human being is a decision. You decided to be here tonight. You could have decided to go to Fremont Street. I know all of you are smarter than that. I mean, you know, but you could have. You know, you could have decided to go to the casino. Mm -hmm. Massage the machine, you know. I see people, you know, their holy cards around the machine, and, you know, they even, they, somebody even came and got some of my blessed and exercised oil, and uh, apparently they're anointing the machine. Oh my I'm serious. Oh my yeah. This is, I mean, it happened to me before. I was in a casino once, okay, and I was walking through the casino. I was in the casino going to a restaurant, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I'm in the casino walking through this casino. Somebody recognized me. And they're like, Father, come over, come over. I'm like, well, I wonder what the person wants. And she's like, bless the machine for me, please. <laughs> and I was like, only if you give me 10%. <laughs> but it's a decision. You are a decision. The human being is a decision. Faith is a decision. It's all about a decision. And the decision... Who's got the power to make the decision? You. That's Jesus made you free. We're no, he says, I no longer call you slaves. You're my friends. We are free. We're free to choose. God bless America. Mm, that's why I love being in America. Because mm -hmm. we are free. Mm? We can choose. God bless the United States of America. Mm, let freedom reign. You know? Thank God we're not in a communist place. Uh, look, look, look. Anyway, I won't get into too much of that because I, I shouldn't. I can't. I just can't. Okay. You know, I, I, I have to. <laughs> in other words, stop running from yourself. Huh? Stop running from yourself. Mm? Let's get into the 40. The number of change in the Bible. Let's go into the desert and bring change into our life. And as we take that change in right now. <laughs> 